If you were held hostage by a group of psychos who demanded that you make an impossible sacrifice, what would you do? The apocalypse is coming, and there's only one way to stop it. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the doomsdayers and knock at the cabin. This family is about to have their whole world come to an end. Playing alone in the woods on a sunny afternoon, seven-year-old Wen catches grasshoppers and puts them in a big jar. She names each one and jots down details about them in her notebook. Just then, she notices a huge man walking slowly towards her down the path. The man approaches Wen and asks if they can talk for a little bit. Wen says she doesn't talk to strangers, but the man says that he wants to be friends, so they won't be strangers for long. He asks her name and introduces himself as Leonard, reaching out his enormous hand to shake hers. He asks if he can help her catch grasshoppers and gently grabs one from a nearby plant before adding it to her jar. They talk for a minute about her two adoptive fathers, Eric and Andrew. When Leonard begins to stare nervously into the forest, Wen asks him what's wrong, but Leonard changes the subject and asks how old she is. She mentions that her eighth birthday is in a few days, and Leonard gives her a flower as an early present, but says that if she doesn't like it, they can play a game with it instead. They'll each pull a petal off and ask each other a question. After a few turns, Leonard asks Wen about the scar on her lip and says that he doesn't have a scar like her. But if she could look inside, she would see his heart is broken because of what he has to do. Three more people approach from the trees holding makeshift weapons. Wen asks if they're Leonard's friends, but he says they're more like co-workers, and they've come because they have a very important job to do. She gets nervous and starts to run back to the cabin, and Leonard yells that she needs to tell her dad to let them in, or they will have to find their own way. Wen slams the door shut and runs through the cabin to the back deck, where Andrew and Eric are listening to music. She tells them that scary strangers are coming, and that they need to come inside right Right now. They get up and follow Wen inside, and she locks the door behind them. Andrew and Eric ask what's wrong, and think Wen is describing Jehovah's Witnesses, when suddenly they hear several forceful knocks at the cabin door. Leonard introduces himself and asks them to please open up. They decide to tell him to go away nicely, and Eric says politely that they'd like to be left alone. Leonard says that he understands, and he's sorry, but they need their help to save a whole bunch of people, and can't do it without them. Andrew peeks out of the window, and sees that they're all holding some kind of strange weapon. He goes to the phone to call the police, but the line has been cut, and they don't get any cell service this far in the woods. Andrew yells that he has a gun, but it's really in the safe in his truck, and the group calls his bluff, giving him one more chance to let them in. Just then, Leonard and his friends surround the cabin and start trying to break in. Andrew and Eric run frantically around the house, locking windows and barricading the doors to stop anyone from entering. One of Leonard's group, Redmond, starts smashing through the back door. Andrew picks up Wen, and Eric grabs two pokers from the fireplace to use as weapons. They decide to run for the car, but just as they get to the door, they're confronted by another of Leonard's crew, Sabrina. Eric attacks her, but she trips him, and he hits his head, knocking him unconscious. Sabrina immediately tries to help him, yelling that she's a nurse, but Andrew attacks her and forces her away. He tries to wake Eric up, but that's when Leonard and Redmond manage to get in. Andrew starts beating Redmond up, but Leonard is able to grab Wen while he's distracted and tells Andrew to stop. Okay, their vacation to an isolated cabin in the woods just started, and they've already been kidnapped by axe-wielding weirdos. It's time to really assess the problem here. Eric and Andrew, what better way to do that than with our new segment, You up. I think we should begin with their first big mistake, letting Wen play alone in the woods. Eric and Andrew may want to give their daughter a sense of freedom, but this is a decision they'll quickly come to regret. Anyone who spent time in the dense forests of the American Northeast knows that there are countless horrific things that can happen out there to an unsupervised seven-year-old child. To start, she could easily trip and fall, hurting herself, stumbling into the lake, or even walking right off of a cliff. One wrong step and it's bye-bye birdie. It might seem like she's too smart for that, but you never know what could happen if she was distracted chasing grasshoppers, and even the most seasoned hikers often have accidents on the trail. Something as simple as a sprained ankle could be a death sentence if she's too far to call for help, and neither of her parents know where she went. She's also unfamiliar with the area, and could easily become lost if she wanders even a few yards out of sight of the cabin. As many as 42% of all cases where hikers get lost happen because they wandered off the trail. Forests are nearly impossible to navigate without marked trails in the middle of the day, and it's late in the afternoon when Wen is playing outside. The sun sets quickly in the forest, and I can tell you from personal experience that being lost in the woods at night with no flashlight or idea where you are is not a position you want to be in. In many places in the wilderness, rescue can be extremely difficult, expensive, and dangerous for the emergency responders, and that's if they even know where to look. There are also lots of harmful plants and dangerous wildlife out there that Wen could easily run into. Poison ivy and sumac can quickly turn a trip to the woods into a trip to the hospital if you don't know how to identify them, and can even be deadly if consumed. I'll give Wen 
one credit, she seems smart enough to not go around just eating random plants that she finds on the forest floor. But I've heard of kids doing stupider things, and she is a very inquisitive child, so you never know what she might decide to touch. The woods are also home to bears, coyotes, bobcats, rattlesnakes, venomous spiders, and even Lyme disease carrying ticks, all of which do not make good playmates for a child. This is real life, not the Jungle Book, and in this story, Baloo would make her a snack, not sing her a song. That's not to mention Stranger Danger. Thousands of people from children to grown adults have gone missing in the American wilderness over the years, and some of these have been proven cases of kidnapping. They may be far from any signs of people, and the chances of running into someone out here might be very small, but that also means that there's no one to witness or help if a kid stealing creep does happen to find them. They could easily have been followed from the nearest town, with a kidnapper waiting just out of sight for Eric and Andrew to let their guard down. Sure enough, Leonard shows up, but lucky for them, he isn't out to hurt Gwen. Leaving her to explore the woods alone was a dangerous choice at best, and a borderline case for child neglect at worst. A visit from an apocalypse cult may be unexpected, but Eric and Andrew were certainly provided with ample warning from Gwen. They didn't take her seriously until it was already too late. I know kids can be dramatic and often make things up, but if your daughter came running from the woods in a state of panic, telling you that four armed strangers were on their way, what did you, I don't know, spring into action instead of casually laughing it off? I mean, seriously. Would one of them care to even just peek out of the window before a human refrigerator starts banging their front door down? If they think their child is mature enough to wander around in the woods unsupervised, then you'd think they'd believe her more quickly when she says they're all in danger. Now here's where the situation went from bad to horror movie. Eric and Andrew's embarrassing failure to defend the cabin from Leonard's crew. Leonard himself is an extremely intimidating guy, and not someone I'd want to take on in a fair fight. But the rest of his posse should be easy pickings for two adult men, especially since they're fighting to protect their child. And Andrew is a trained boxer who also has a gun. But wait, what's that? He left the gun in the car? Of all places, how was he planning to get to it there if he needed to use it? Was he going to ask the home invaders politely to let him go grab it from the car? Out there, it's essentially useless. It could even be used against them if the bad guys get their hands on it. Experts say that for home defense purposes, your weapon should be securely stored somewhere that you can quickly access it, like under the bed or in a closet near the front door. If Andrew just had his piece on him, this whole hostage situation would have been over. But unfortunately, Leonard caught him lacking, and they'll have to use whatever they can find around the house to fight back. Once they realized the cabin was surrounded, Eric and Andrew needed to dig in instead of attempting to escape. Even though they have no service and the phone lines are cut, they still should have tried to use the SOS feature on their cell phones and then found a defensible position while they waited for help to arrive. The basement would have been a great place to make their stand, since there are only two ways for anyone to get in or out. As they went down, they could have quickly damaged the step, hopefully causing the first of the attackers who rushed them to fall and break their neck. Then, Andrew could have held them off at one entrance since he's a trained fighter, and Eric could have kept Wen safe while they watched their backs and kept an eye on their escape route. If they were able to quickly take out Leonard, then the rest of the group would be no problem, and might even flee when they saw their leader go down. But as we see, they don't put up much of a fight, and the crazies quickly gain the upper hand. When you're seven-year-old daughter ends up a hostage to four psycho prophets of the apocalypse, you f***ed up Eric and Andrew. Eric wakes up and sees that he and Andrew have been tied to chairs. He has a severe concussion and is extremely sensitive to loud noises and bright lights. Leonard apologizes for attacking them, but Andrew is furious and thinks they targeted them specifically because they're a same-sex couple. Leonard assures them that this isn't the case and calls everyone from his group into the room. One at a time, each member of the group steps forward and introduces themselves to Andrew and Eric. Sabrina is first and tells them about her family and career as a nurse. She mentions that she's from California and had to spend most of her savings to get out here to talk to them. Next, Next, Leonard steps forward and tells him that he's a second grade teacher. Redman introduces himself sarcastically and says that none of this matters because of what they have to do. But Leonard says Andrew and Eric deserve to know who they are. He gives in and tells them about himself, mentioning that he's gone to jail in the past for making stupid decisions. Finally, Adrian steps forward and frantically introduces herself, mentioning her job as a cook. When they're finished, Leonard ominously announces that it's time. Leonard steps to the front of the group and explains that they're here to stop the apocalypse. Whether the world ends or not is entirely up to Andrew, Eric, and and when, they will have to choose to willingly sacrifice and kill one of the three of them. If they fail to choose or fail to follow through with their choice, everyone on Earth will die except for them. Eric says they haven't done anything wrong, and Leonard agrees they don't deserve this, but they were chosen by fate. Leonard promises that they aren't here to hurt them, but can't choose or act for them, and they're not allowed to sacrifice themselves, and one of them must kill the sacrifice. Andrew shouts that he'd rather watch the world die a hundred times than choose to sacrifice anyone from his family, but Leonard warns them that the group have 
we've all seen visions of what will happen if they don't choose. He says that first, massive tsunamis will come and destroy the coastal cities. Then, a terrible plague will get everyone sick. The skies will fall, and God's fingers will scorch the earth as an everlasting darkness descends over mankind. Andrew shouts at him, asking how he knows this, saying he sounds like every crazy doomsday. Eric tries to reason with Leonard, arguing that dreams can have different meanings, but Leonard simply asks if they'll make a choice, and they both refuse. Redman walks to the front of the group and puts his weapon on the floor. He kneels and pulls a white hood out of his pocket, crying and saying that he's scared. He demands that Eric and Andrew don't look away and pulls the mask over his head, trembling. Eric notices a bright light reflecting the picture frame behind him and a person-shaped figure standing next to the group. Suddenly, the rest of the group step forward and surround Redman. He says, a part of humanity has been judged, and Sabrina and Adrian violently stab him in the head with their tools. Redman falls to the floor, and Leonard steps forward, cutting his head off with his axe. That makes one doomsdayer down, with three more to go. Okay, it's the end of the world as we know it, and nobody feels fine. Poor Eric took a nasty blow to the head and is showing signs of a severe concussion. The symptoms of a concussion include headaches, nausea, blurred vision, sensitivity to light and noise, and confusion, which is not how you want to be feeling when your family's lives are at stake. The most important part of recovering from a concussion is getting plenty of physical and mental rest, which is hard to do when you're being held hostage by a guy who says God wants you to sacrifice your seven-year-old daughter. Being tied to a chair with your hands behind your back like Eric and Andrew is never a position you want to be in. But there are actually things you can do here to give yourself a chance at escape. Right away, you want to start twisting your wrists and moving your arms up and down to gradually stretch the rope out. It won't be easy, but if you can get the rope loose enough that you can start working on the knot, you just might be able to break free and turn the tables on your attacker. Now, let's talk about the so-called impossible choice. Sacrifice a loved one to stop the apocalypse. While this would be a very noble act if the fate of the world was really at stake, Eric and Andrew have absolutely no reason to believe this is true now. All they know for sure is that a group of psychos with freaky weapons just ambushed them in the middle of the woods and took them hostage. Leonard doesn't even have any proof that what he's saying is true. So what are Eric and Andrew supposed to do? Just take his word for it? The answer for me so far is an empathetic no, and that's a no-brainer. After seeing what happened to Redman, the important question I'd be asking myself now is how the hell am I going to get out of here? It's time to come up with an escape plan and fast. The good news is these freaks are about to do all the work for me, and the answer is so obvious you might not even think of it at first. Leonard makes it clear that according to their visions, nobody in the group can harm Eric or Andrew, and after they refused to make a choice, they ended up sacrificing one of their own. So, I would just sit back and wait them out. It looks like they're all going to kill each other if I just say no four times, and since I don't believe their story about the apocalypse yet, why not let them? They all take each other out, and then my family and I can continue our vacation in peace. For the truly devious among us, there are even things that you could do to expedite the process. During their little introductions, each one of these creeps told Eric and Andrew something about themselves that they might be able to use against them. For example, I'd bring up that half-sister back home Sabrina mentioned and tell her that if she's wrong and lets herself be killed like Redmond, then she'll have died for nothing and never get to see her half-sister again. Hopefully if I planted this down in their minds, I could get the group to turn against each other and escape during the chaos, taking my family and getting back to civilization. After finishing off Redmond, Leonard immediately runs to the kitchen and pukes in the sink. They're all very disturbed by what just happened. Leonard and Adrian take Redmond's body outside, while Sabrina scrubs his blood off the floor. Leonard turns on the TV just in time for a special report about a severe earthquake that has put the entire northwestern U.S. coast on tsunami watch. Andrew insists that it doesn't mean anything, but Leonard says he explained to them what would happen and demands they keep watching. The tsunami makes landfall, but citizens are able to evacuate in time, and so far, there are no deaths reported. Andrew asks him to please at least let Eric go, but Leonard ignores him. He says they have to keep watching to see what was shown to them in their visions. Just then, news breaks that another terrible earthquake has struck in the Pacific. The resulting tsunami is absolutely massive, and in an instant, several coastal cities are completely wiped out. Eric sends Wen to her room, and Sabrina turns off the TV. Leonard says that tomorrow morning, they'll have another chance to make their choice, willingly sacrifice one of them to save the rest of the world. For the night, he and his group will tend to their needs, but otherwise leave them to think things over. Andrew says the the answer is still the same, and he's willing to sacrifice everyone in the world for his family. He looks to Eric for reassurance, but Eric seems lost in thought. Sabrina takes Eric to the bedroom to help him with his injured head. She says she's sorry for what's happening, and that she isn't a very religious person, but everything changed when her vision started. She makes it clear that she didn't believe it at first either, but says that soon, Eric will too. Sabrina tells him that everything she's seen in her visions has come true, which is how she built her weapon, met the others, and found the cabin, even down to the exact colors that the others were wearing when they met. She promised 
promises that they're all on the same side, but Eric says that he's only on his family's side. Sabrina brings Eric back to the living room and sets him down in his chair next to Andrew. Behind them, Wen takes her backpack and sneaks down to the basement unseen. Andrew asks Eric if he's okay, but he still seems out of it. He tells Eric that the first earthquake happened four hours before Leonard and his group arrived, and he suspects that they have this whole attack planned out. He wants to make sure that Eric is thinking straight after his head injury, and that Sabrina didn't try to manipulate him when they were alone. But Eric reassures him that he doesn't believe them. Meanwhile, Wen sneaks through the basement and escapes out of the back door, but she accidentally makes a noise and alerts Leonard. She runs off into the woods, but Leonard easily catches up with her, bringing her back to the cabin. Leonard ties Wen to a chair and tries to calm her down again, but Andrew tells her not to listen to him. He insists that they were targeted, and that's when he recognizes Redmond as the guy who assaulted him at a bar many years ago. Andrew says this can't be a coincidence, and tells them if they get his wallet, they'll see his name isn't Redmond. But Leonard refuses. He says it doesn't matter what his name is, but Adrian starts to get worried, saying she can't remember if her vision started before or after she met Redmond online. Leonard tells her that they can't doubt themselves, and shows Andrew a picture of the kids from his basketball team, telling him that he's here for them. He turns Andrew and Eric so they can face each other, and everyone goes to sleep for the night. Okay, things just got real, and it's starting to look like there could be some truth to Leonard's visions. The poor people in the video on the news never stood a chance, but if you find yourself in the path of a tsunami, there are steps you'll need to take quickly if you want to survive. The most important thing to do is evacuate as soon as you get a warning that a tsunami is on the way. Roads and bridges will probably be clogged with traffic or damaged by the earthquake, so your best bet could be just to run or ride a bike. You want to get as far inland and to the highest ground possible as fast as you can, depending on where you are and how much time you have. If you're in a building and don't have time to get somewhere safer, you want to get as high in the building as possible to protect yourself from the floodwaters. If you happen to fall in, try to grab something to help you float and wait until you find a safe way to get back on dry land. Rescue teams should hopefully be coming soon, so once the initial tsunami is over, you'll want to stay where you are and wait for help. A lot of aspects of survival here will honestly come down to dumb luck, but it's important to do what you can to give yourself the best chances of making it out alive. Wen makes a great decision to escape by quietly sneaking out of the basement door. The second she got out of the cabin, she should have ran as fast as she could to get as far away as possible before Leonard came out after her. While she was running, she should have yelled for help to try to get the attention of anyone who might happen to be nearby. If she knew she couldn't get away and had no choice but to hide, she should have tried to hide somewhere that only a child could fit. Leonard is a huge guy, so I would have tried to find a little cave or small space to hide where he couldn't reach me. Hopefully if I kept them distracted for long enough, Andrew and Eric would be able to break free and take care of the others at the cabin. In the morning, Adrian makes Wen some eggs for breakfast. Andrew whispers to Eric the ropes on his hands are loosening up, and he plans to run for the car when he has the chance. Leonard walks into the room and gets ready to start again, but before he has a moment to talk, Andrew asks about the message board Adrian mentioned the day before. Andrew insists that they're experiencing a shared delusion from their online echo chain. Leonard is not convinced, and says they must continue. While the others talk, Wen slips Eric a knife, and he starts to work in his restraints. Eric also tells Wen to remember what she did on Thanksgiving, and to do it again if he nods. The group steps to the center of the room, and Leonard says they need to make their decisions very quickly. Adrian steps forward and makes an emotional appeal to Eric as a mother, insisting the visions have proven to her that this is really happening, and she doesn't want her son to die. Eric asks her what exactly she saw, but Andrew shouts that they don't believe them, and they once again refuse to make a choice. Leonard sighs, and Adrian kneels to the floor, putting on the white mask just like Redmond. She repeats the phrase, a part of humanity has been judged, and Leonard and Sabrina kill her with their makeshift weapons. That makes two doomsdayers down, with two more to go. Leonard carries Adrian's dead body into the next room. When he comes back, he says that hundreds of thousands of people will die now, and asks Sabrina to turn on the TV. Okay, these creeps are clearly committed to their visions, but what if Andrew is right and this really is all in their heads? It's time to take a moment to talk about shared delusions. A shared delusion, or folie à deux, occurs when delusional beliefs and sometimes even hallucinations are transferred from one person to another. One way this can occur is when a dominant person, known as the inducer, forms the belief and imposes it on others. Another way is when two people who are having separate psychotic episodes influence each other's illusions so that they become very similar. Andrew makes a very good point when he brings this up, but in this case, it's unclear if Redmond was the inducer or if they all came up with this on their own, and things just got worse when they found each other. The most important thing to do when treating shared delusions is to separate the sufferers from one another and break up the echo chamber. Once they're broken out of that isolated bubble, you should hopefully be able to get them thinking clearly again. Knowing this, I would have tried to talk to Sabrina or Adrian one-on-one, -on -one, since they seem less convinced than Leonard, and hopefully snap them out of it and got them on my side. 
It's too late for Adrian now, but as the group gets smaller, maybe the delusion will become less intense, and there's still a chance of winning Sabrina over before it's too late. Sabrina turns on the TV, and the group watches a news report about the recent outbreak of a novel disease called the X9 virus in several major cities around the world, including Nashville, Tennessee. The five of them sit in stunned silence, when suddenly Eric turns to Andrew and says that he thinks he had a vision of a person. Leonard stops the TV and asks him where he saw this, and Eric says it was in the light reflected in the mirror behind Redmond right before they killed him. Andrew argues that Eric is feeling sensitive to light from his concussion and goes on to explain that the X9 virus has been spreading for months before this. He notices from the banner at the bottom of the TV screen that the news report isn't live, but instead a pre-programmed show and says that Leonard already knew this was happening before they showed up. Eric agrees with Andrew and then nods at Gwen, who starts to throw a huge temper tantrum. Leonard tries to calm her down, and while he's distracted, Eric cuts his hands free and dives to the floor in front of Wen, grabbing a weapon and swinging it wildly at him. In the chaos, Andrew frees himself as well and sneaks out through the front door, but Sabrina chases him. Andrew makes it to the car, when suddenly Sabrina bashes him in the leg with her weapon. She stops and reaches out her hand, not wanting to hurt Andrew, but refusing to let him escape. Andrew throws dirt in her eyes, blinding her, and gets inside the car and locks the doors. He crawls to the trunk and grabs his gun from the safe, just as Sabrina breaks the window. She stabs him several times in the side, but he loads his pistol and quickly fires a shot right by her head. He tells her to back up, and Sabrina runs away into the woods. Andrew notices that she slashed their car tires and hobbles back inside the cabin, where he finds Leonard confronting Eric. Andrew points his pistol at Leonard and tells him to drop his weapon, but Leonard still won't listen. He says that it's time for the next sacrifice and asks them to make a choice, but Andrew says he's taking his family and leaving. Suddenly, Sabrina charges at him from just out of sight, and Andrew shoots her in the chest, killing her. That makes three doomsdayers down, with one more to go. Okay, things have gone from bad to worse, and Leonard says there's still more coming. After coronavirus, the last thing society wants is to go through another pandemic, but that's exactly what Adrian's death seems to have unleashed on the world. In order to survive, people are going to have to remember the lessons they learned during the last worldwide outbreak. To give yourself a better chance of not getting sick, it's important to visit your doctor for regular health checkups. You always want to be stocked up on any medications that you may need, and up to date on all of your doctor-recommended vaccinations. You also want to make sure you have plenty of water and non-perishable food stashed in case they trip to the grocery stores out of the question washing your hands thoroughly and often, practicing social distancing when necessary, and staying home while sick will all slow the spread of the disease and help keep yourself and others alive. While the news of people dying from the X9 disease is extremely sad, Andrew noticing that the report isn't live does make Leonard seem extremely suspicious. A pre-programmed show about an outbreak that has been gradually building for months definitely wouldn't be enough to convince me to sacrifice a loved one. Eric may believe he saw a vision in the lights behind Redmond, but hallucinations are a very common side effect of severe head trauma. Since Eric is clearly still suffering from his concussion, I wouldn't put a lot of trust in these visions he was suddenly having, especially since this group showed up and put the idea of the visions in his head. When and Eric causing a distraction and allowing Andrew to run out to the car for the gun is a great move. Andrew has to go through a lot of steps to get to it and pays the price as Sabrina mangles him in various ways. But lucky for Andrew, she isn't willing to kill him and he's able to get to the pistol. Now that he's got his hands on a gun, if he keeps his cool and makes the right decisions, this nightmare is as good as over. For as big as Leonard is, there's nothing he can do to stop Andrew now and Sabrina finds out the hard way what will happen if they try to rush him. All Andrew has to do is take Eric and Wen and walk away but something tells me this horror story isn't over yet. Leonard puts the white hood over Sabrina's body and stands over her, ready to continue his ritual. Andrew tells him to stop, but Leonard simply asks if he's ready to make a sacrifice, and when he declines, Leonard once again repeats the phrase, a part of humanity has been judged, and cuts off her head. Andrew exits the cabin, telling Eric to keep an eye on Leonard, and yell if he does anything, and goes out to the porch to grab Redman's wallet from his pocket. He takes out his ID and throws it on the floor in front of Leonard, showing that Redman's real name was actually Rory, Ben, the guy who assaulted Andrew at the bar. Andrew is now convinced that the whole story was just a plan to torture them and demands that Leonard get inside the bathroom or he'll kill him. Andrew and Eric block the bathroom door with a chair, but just as they're getting ready to run, they hear the window shatter. Andrew won't go outside until he's sure that Leonard is still in the bathroom so he decides to open the door. Inside, he sees that the window is broken, but it looks much too small for Leonard to fit through. Andrew looks at the shower and fires a shot through the curtain, but it hits nothing. 
He looks around in the panic, totally confused, and goes back to pull the shower curtain, when suddenly Leonard bursts out and tackles him. Eric, Andrew, and Leonard fight, but he's too strong and easily overpowers them, wrestling the gun away from Andrew. Leonard says he won't kill them, but will shoot them in the leg to stop them from leaving the cabin, and asks them to turn on the TV if they want to be convinced. Eric turns on the news, and they watch reports of hundreds of planes mysteriously falling from the sky all over the world. Eric stares in horror at the TV, starting to believe. Leonard says he's heard this before, and stands in front of the TV, somehow able to predict word for word what the reporter will say just before she says it. Suddenly, Andrew smashes the TV and demands the keys to Leonard's truck, but it's too late. Eric has been convinced. Andrew begs him to leave, but Leonard says he can tell that even Andrew believes what's going on now and asks them to come out to the back deck. He sits down in a rocking chair and holds a knife to his arm, saying that when he's gone, they'll only have minutes to stop what will happen. Eric and Andrew send Wen to wait in the treehouse with her headphones on and tell her not to come out until one of them comes to get her. Leonard begs them one last time to make a choice and save the world, but they remain silent. He speaks the words, all of humanity has been judged, and dies just like the rest of his friends. That makes four doomsdayers down and only moments left to decide. Leonard falls back in his chair as the skies turn dark and light Lightning strikes all around them, setting the woods on fire. Eric tells Andrew that he can feel the presence of the figure he saw in the light, and Andrew admits that he believes him. Andrew says that the three of them should still go on no matter what happens, but Eric believes families have had to decide this through all of the time, and that Leonard and his group were really the four horsemen of the apocalypse, representing all aspects of humanity. Redmond represented malice, Adrian nurturing, Sabrina healing, and Leonard guidance. He thinks they had to watch them die and feel their loss before they could fully understand and make their decision. Andrew is furious and argues that humanity doesn't deserve their sacrifice, but Eric says he can feel that they need to do this and wants Andrew to kill him now while he's thinking of Wen's future. Andrew trembles, but he knows what he has to do and shoots Eric. Okay, Eric and Andrew just made an impossible choice and hopefully saved the world. Wen will have to grow up without one of her fathers, but his sacrifice is what made it possible for her to have a world to grow up in at all. Andrew had a gun on Leonard, his family was safe, and all he had to do was walk away and shoot Leonard if he came after them. But somehow, he managed to screw this up. Trapping Leonard in the bathroom was a good idea and would hopefully slow him down if he decided to chase them. So why on earth would Andrew decide to open the door to see if he was still in there? I understand that he heard the glass break and was worried that Leonard might be waiting outside to jump them, but they've spent enough time in this cabin that Andrew has to have been inside the bathroom at least once. So wouldn't he remember that the only window in there is way too tiny for Leonard to climb through? Even if he didn't remember this, when he opens the door and sees that there's no possible way Leonard could have gotten out, it's pretty obvious that Leonard is still in there, and he should have just slammed the door shut again right away. I would have closed the door and calmly exited the cabin with my family, and if Leonard tried to jump me, well, I would have just shot him. It's pretty simple when you think about it, but Andrew managed to get himself tackled and his weapons stolen. Now the 6 foot 4 300 pound home intruder has a gun and their chances of escape are looking worse by the second. On the news they see planes falling from the sky and Eric is finally convinced. But there are several explanations for why a plane might crash that don't involve an act of God. Pilot error, maintenance issues, faulty equipment, and even bad weather can all cause planes to crash. And while it is a very rare occurrence, it's not impossible that some man-made issue or attack could cause many of them to fall from the sky all at once. Keeping that in mind, Planes crashing all over the world would definitely be an upsetting thing to witness, but I still wouldn't be convinced beyond any doubt of Leonard's story. After Leonard dies, Eric and Andrew are left alone to make their final decision, and Eric is fully convinced the story is true. He mentions that the four members of Leonard's group represent the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and there are subtle clues that indicate this may be true, although their traditional roles are for the most part reversed. In the Book of Revelation, the four horsemen are death, famine, war, and conquest, and their arrival marks the beginning of Judgment Day. Redman and his violent past represent and Malice or the Horseman War, and he is dressed in red to match War's red horse. Adrian is a cook and represents nurturing, the inverse of famine, and wears black to match his black horse. Sabrina the nurse represents healing, and so she's the inverse of the Horseman Death. The color of her clothes yellow also matches the color of Death's horse. Finally, there's Leonard, who represents guidance. His good nature is the inverse of the Horseman Conquest, and he wears white, matching Conquest's white horse. If this is all just by coincidence, then it's a pretty big one, and I can see where Eric is coming from, even with his bump to the head. In the end, even with all this evidence and the world ending around me, I still don't think I would have made the sacrifice. I'll be the first to admit that things look pretty convincing, but given that there's still even a tiny chance that this was all in their heads, there would be no way that I could do it. Eric, however, has made his decision, and with his sacrifice, he's hopefully saved the world. Andrew goes to the treehouse to get wet, and she can tell from his look that something terrible has happened. She asks if Daddy Eric saved everyone, 
and Andrew crawls to her crying as heavy rain begins to fall. Lightning strikes a tree near the cabin, and it falls through the roof, engulfing the entire building in flames. Andrew and Wen walk through the forest together, and eventually find the truck that Leonard and his group arrived in, the key sitting right on the center console. They get in, and drive away together. Down the road, Wen asks if they can stop at a diner. They pull in and notice news reports on the TV, showing that the tsunamis, plane crashes, and viral infections have all ended. Everyone in the diner is relieved, and it seems like everything is going to be okay. They go back to the car, and Andrew finds several belongings of Leonard, Rory, Sabrina, and Adrian's, including a picture of Adrian's son. They start the truck, and a song that reminds them of Eric is playing on the radio. They turn it off at first, but decide to let it play, and drive off to continue the rest of their life together. The apocalypse is postponed, and the innocent people of the world are saved. But what do you think? How would you be knock at the cabin? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this, and don't forget that from now on, we will be uploading on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.